Thank you all for joining us for this uh, International Perspectives, The Diverse Journeys of Women in STEM. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm meeting you from today here in Canberra. I'm speaking to you from Ngunnawal country and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So my name is Julianne Guevara and I'm Australia's ambassador for gender equality and I'm your moderator for today's exciting discussion. Um, we hope that this session today sparks your interest and curiosity and encourages women from across our region to consider studying STEM degrees and pursuing a STEM career. So today, of course, you'll hear from three women who have very diverse and exciting careers. We have an astrophysicist, a cyber expert, and an expert in bananas. In fact, I think I've seen on YouTube her being referred to as banana mama. So firstly, uh, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith. Uh, Lisa is Australia's ambassador for women in STEM. Um, she will tell us about her role and why it exists and a little bit about her career. After that, she will join a panel along with Tagalima Nimea, who's a cyber expert from Samoa, and Dr. Fini uh, Devani, who is a geneticist and a, a molecular biologist from Indonesia. So the panel will discuss their careers and also the impacts of their work. Uh, as audience members, of course, you're welcome to ask questions. Uh, please post them in the Zoom chat. And if there's time at the end, um, some of these questions will try and select and be directed to the panel. So uh, without further ado, I'd now like to pass to Lisa Harvey-Smith, our wonderful ambassador for women in STEM. Lisa, I'll let you introduce yourself and your role uh, and tell us a little bit about what you do. Thanks. Thank you so much, Julianne, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, or maybe good morning from wherever you're joining us in the world. It's great to have this dialogue um, about STEM careers in a very exciting uh, world of technology and science. Um, I'm speaking to you uh, from Muanina country in uh, southern Australia, and uh, as Australia's Women in STEM ambassador, my role is to work with the government, uh, with the business sector, and with education sector as well, to make STEM education and careers more accessible and safer for women. Um, before I was appointed into this role, um, I was a full-time astrophysicist uh, for almost 20 years, working um, in studies from uh, the UK, from Germany, the Netherlands, and then finally to Australia. Um, so it, it's been a really exciting journey. Nowadays, um, I'm actually also a, an author of children's books and a couple of adults books too on astrophysics. Um, so my career has kind of taken a bit of a, a path and um, I've written more than 50 scientific papers as well in my research, which focuses on the birth and death of stars, so how they're born and die in our galaxy. I've studied magnetic fields in space and how they shape amazing clouds of glowing gas in our, in our galaxy. And I've studied um, distant galaxies and supermassive black holes. And uh, it's it really great to use the physics and mathematical skills that I learned in my university degrees um, to actually look at the universe and tr try to understand more about its history. I've worked for many years on very exciting international projects, including um, the development of the Square Kilometre Array, or SKA, which is a huge radio telescope, um, which is currently being built in Australia and South Africa. And many countries around the world have come together to create this very exciting project. So when it's built, when it's finished, it will be the most powerful radio telescope in the world and we'll look at millions of years of the history of our universe um, in radio waves. So invisible waves that are coming to us from distant stars and galaxies. And this project is wonderful because it, it just typifies the international collaboration that makes science so special um, and allows people from different nations to come together in uh, study and in, I guess, the practice of science as well. Outside of science, I sit on the advisory board 
for the Australian Space Agency, which is quite a new agency, um, only about three years old, but our space industry is booming, um, which is very exciting. And it's great to be on that advisory committee. And I'm also on the Questacon advisory committee. That's for our um, national scientific, um, wonderful science center um, that is hosting this event today. I've written five popular science books, um, books for children uh, as well. And um, that's a really wonderful part of my uh, career journey that I enjoy very much. But since I was appointed um, as Australia's Women in STEM ambassador, I focused on creating Australia's STEM stars of the future. So my team and I work closely with the Australian government to build the visibility of women in STEM and to create positive changes in our society. We do it because it's the right thing to do, but it's also sensible economically. Um, advanced mathematical and physical sciences are worth $145 billion a year to our economy. And according to a report from a few years ago um, of the economy and, and the contributions um, of different parts of it, if 1% of Australian women um, moved into the STEM workforce, it would add $57 billion to our economy over the next 20 years. So this is why governments um, are very, very keen to get more women and girls working in STEM. But of course, it's important for other reasons. Women need to have access to well-paying jobs um, for women's economic security, um, as well as taking their rightful place in designing the technology that really defines our culture and our society uh, today. And technologies are coming into every area of work. So the, this is really an important thing that young people see in race. Um, but Australia, like many places in the world, has a serious shortage of women working in STEM jobs. Um, and it's particularly bad in engineering and computing. So um, we're really keen to increase the participation of women in the STEM workforce. So to tackle this problem, we got together a couple of years ago, um, armed with some government money to bring together people from all across the STEM sector to create um, a 10 year plan for women in STEM. And that was a really great project because it helped us to understand reasons um, why people aren't necessarily going into STEM careers and um, to have a plan to achieve uh, greater participation. So we've also got um, a STEM women database, which was launched um, just over a year ago, I think, and has thousands of women signed up. Um, and these are women who work in STEM and they're willing to go into schools to talk to um, young people about STEM careers and also um, people who may wish to join boards or committees in, in large companies. Um, so it's really giving women opportunities uh, to speak to the media, to speak to schools and to get greater visibility of women working in, in these areas. We've got a, a wonderful Girls in STEM Toolkit, which is a website for um, young people in secondary education, so in high school, who can go to this, this place and really see some exciting uh, role models, some exciting resources, and also great resources for teachers who can make their um, workplaces, their uh, schools more gender equitable. Um, so showing kids role models um, that aren't just people like Einstein, uh, the traditional scientists that maybe we learnt about, um, those of us who are a bit older and show that there are thousands and thousands of women making discoveries as there always were um, and as there always will be in the future, women doing great work in science and making those women more visible is what we try to do. And my office runs a Future You campaign, which shows kids in primary school um, really exciting STEM careers using non-traditional role models um, in the form of fun animated characters. So we launched the campaign um, last year and it's been seen by more than 3 million young Australians. And we've measured um, a threefold increase in positive attitudes to STEM education amongst girls who've seen the campaign. And slightly smaller, but uh, all the equally important increases in boys' um, assessments of how 
exciting and uh, important STEM is in the world. So that's really great that um, we're able to create um, role models for young people and try and drive young people to see more options for themselves in STEM. We've also got initiatives to improve workplaces. So the government has funded the SAGE initiative um, and the SAGE initiative is, it guides universities and research organizations to um, just sort of on a journey to remove the barriers to women's participation in the workforce um, and women's leadership as well. So that our universities and research places will have more women in leadership and better workplaces. Um, for example, um, things like equal parental leave um, in workplaces so that men can take um, more responsibility for looking after children. So we're trying to really dismantle some of the structural barriers uh, that women face in education and careers. Um, I've delivered more than uh, workshops to more than 11,000 teachers um, to help schools do better and avoid um, gender stereotypes in their classrooms. Um, and we're trying to raise awareness of the, the benefits of STEM jobs amongst teachers as well. Um, and we're changing the way that uh, re research funding is assessed. So when people submit applications for research funding, uh, we're removing the names of the applicants so that they can be assessed on their merits and um, not on uh, maybe some stereotypes or assumptions about the applicants. So we're doing a lot of different work. And it's important because by building a system where all talents are recognised, uh, we create an inclusive STEM culture that delivers great innovation, new ideas, um, and science and technology that benefits everyone in society. So it's our common aim as nations around the world to work together to this, uh, to this end. And it's great to see um, colleagues from different nations today who are going to share their STEM journeys um, with everyone. I really love this discussion. So thank you once again for having me in this discussion. Um, and I look forward to uh, our panel session. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, so much, Lisa, for that really uh, insightful introduction. I mean, I think it's great to hear, of course, the work that you're doing as Australia's ambassador for STEM, um, the importance, obviously, of engaging with young uh, women and girls at an early age about the possibilities and the variety of work that you can do in various STEM uh, fields, I think is really fantastic. Um, really pleased too that you obviously highlighted, um, you know, the significant opportunities that you have for international cooperation. And I think, you know, that will be a little bit on display here today, of course, with uh, the other panellists. So it is now uh, my great privilege to officially welcome our other panellists who are joining us from across the Asia Pacific region. Firstly, I'll turn to uh, Tagalima Namia, who is the Principal PC and Network Officer for the Samoan uh, Ministry of Finance, a position that she's held for after several successful careers in both the Samoan private and public sectors. Having completed her master's degree at RMIT, she's the first Samoan woman uh, based in country to be a cybersecurity expert. Uh, uh, Tagalima believes in leading by example, and she will use her IT skills and experience of working within male dominated environments to inspire Samoan women to become IT literate and to be bold enough to follow their chosen career paths. Uh, she would like to set up information centers and online platforms that empower Samoan women to access new career opportunities, skills enrichment programs. So thank you so much for joining us today, Tagalima. Um, I then have the, uh, the privilege of uh, introducing Dr. Fini Devani. Uh, Dr. Devani has earned her PhD in biology from the University of Melbourne in 2004. She is an associate professor at the School of Life Science and Technology at Bangdang uh, Institute of Technology in Indonesia, and uh, specially appointed associate professor at the Department of Advanced Science and Biotechnology 
at the Graduate School of Engineering at Osaka uh, University in Japan. Her research group, uh, the Genetics and uh, Molecular Biotechnology Research Group is affectionately known as the Banana Group. The group's goal is to improve Indonesia's fruit quality through pre and post harvest technologies. The group has also been involved in space uh, biology research since 2007. And in 2011, the team successfully sent Indonesian tomato seeds to the International Space Station as the first Indonesian space biology experiment. So thank you uh, to both uh, Tagalima and Dr. Feeney for joining us today uh, from, from your respective countries. I would now um, like to begin uh, asking you a few questions, if I could. Um, maybe first turning to Dr. Feeney and then Tagalima and then uh, to Lisa. I was hoping that you might share experiences of when did you fall in love with STEM? And when did you decide that STEM was for you? Um, Dr. Feeney, if I could turn to you first, please. Thank you very much, Julianne. And also thank you for the organizer uh, to invite me to this uh, prestigious event. And it's very happy to have you here. Uh, actually, I've fallen in love uh, with STEM uh, since I was very young at elementary school. I was chosen as a doctor kecil in Indonesian or a little doctor at my school to take care of my friends at a school. Uh, then I, when I was uh, sixth grade, when I saw a TV news um, about one of Indonesian women scientists, uh, Professor Pratiwi Sudarmono, uh, she is uh, the first Indonesian astronaut. And then I had a dream to become an Indonesian astronaut too. But unfortunately, until now, my dream to become an astronaut is not come true. <laughs> uh, however, in 2007, uh, there is an opportunity to learn space biology in JAXA, uh, Japan Space Agency. And in 2011, uh, then uh, I became one of the space seed for uh, Asian future team member uh, together with scientists from across the Asia Pacific country and uh, send Indonesia to uh, seeds to space. Uh, so in parallel, uh, we also developed Ronde's experiment to study the effect of microgravity in banana ripening. So yeah, despite I couldn't reach my dream, I'm, I'm glad that we have sent uh, Indonesian tomato to become astronaut, <laughs> tomato not. Okay, thank you, Julia. And that's my, yeah, why, uh, when I'm falling in love with them. <laughs> Super. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Feeney. Um, Tagalima, can I turn to you? What made you fall in love? Thank you, Julianne. Um, so I was I first became interested in science um, when I was in year eight. I had this uh, amazing uh, science teacher and she was more a role model to me. Um, it got me interested that I would work so hard to try and get full marks for any assignments in science. And that was when, and so science became my favorite subject. And um, because of my teacher's encouragement and um, support, um, during high school, I always thought of, of uh, becoming a doctor. But um, it wasn't until later that um, I was uh, at a um, time to try uh, decide on what to do as a, to undertake as a bachelor's degree that my dad, whom was really sick at the moment, or I mean, at the time, he um, he said to me, um, do something that when you come back, I'm still here. And so this was something that, you know, kind of made me thought and um, change my path. And um, so instead of uh, undertaking a doctor's degree, which will take about six or more years, I decided to pursue a degree in computing science um, for three years. And that was, that's how it led me to um, a, career, a path in uh, IT career. Great. It's amazing, yes, those stories about how influential teachers can be. And it goes to the point, I suppose, that Lisa was making earlier about the importance of teachers, um, you know, creating that, that mindset that there are opportunities for you. So Lisa, can I turn to you? Yeah, I mean, there's so many moments, aren't there, in life when you get some inspiration. But the ones I remember really when um, I was about 11 or 12 and um, I lived in quite a rural 
area so away from a lot of city lights and um my dad and I went into the garden to look at the stars one night and um he had read um, an article in the newspaper saying that you could see the planet Mars. So we went outside and had a look um, and he didn't know where to look and I didn't know where to look. And we were kind of staring up at the stars. And uh, I remember it saying it was very orange color, very distinctive, bright orange. And we found it. And after that, I was just amazed by this, you know, experience. And, you, you know, we got... Um, a really old 1950s star atlas, like a, a book, paper book of, of the, the skies. And I learned how to identify the different groups of stars or constellations. And um, yeah, I never looked back. I just became obsessed with uh, astrophysics. Um, I wanted to become an astrophysicist. I didn't even know what that was or how you could do it. Um, but yeah, after reading a million books and and then uh, deciding to go for it, um, obviously went to university and studied for seven years to, to actually get my PhD and, um, and become a researcher. But it was just, uh, I fell in love really as a child and that was, that was a great moment. So it's really important for parents, I think, as well as, um, you know, the, the great things teachers do, but all parents have the, the capability to inspire their children, even if they don't really know much about science, because my dad didn't. Feeding curiosity, I think that's a really uh, good point to, to add to the conversation. Um, Tagalima, could I ask you, uh, how did studying in Australia contribute to your career? Because I think, yes, as I mentioned in your bio, you studied in Australia. What doors did studying in Australia open for you when you returned home to Samoa? Um, well, uh, cybersecurity was not a degree that was offered locally, but um, having the chance to uh, study abroad um, and coming back gave me like gave me confidence, and um, you know I had the ability to apply for a job that I've always wanted. And um, since I've returned, I've had opportunities to work in partnership with. Um, uh, a network that, you know, through some network, I was able to work in partnership with the Girl Kick Academy in uh, Australia. Um, so to launch a Girl Kick Academy in Samoa. So we were, we wanted, we were focusing on um, teaching girls at the age of uh, six to 12, on uh, just the basics of, um, of coding. Um, what we were trying to do is for girls, because, you know, in the Pacific, you don't get much opportunities like um, as in Australia where they have uh, a lot of, uh, you know, camps and coding, um, you know, technology related um, opportunities, but we wanted to give the girls something new um, and hopefully that they could um, uh, develop it as a new hobby, um, be able to have the ability to create their own app or game. and with the goal that um, they will be interested enough to start a career path in technology or, or STEM. Um, and in addition, I am currently working um, with uh, some women in leadership initiative uh, alumni uh, in partnership with uh, women in business. And um, we, we uh, so we do workshops um, for some one families around the, the island um, in different communities. And my contribution to this, um, so I've been educating parents and uh, children on um, some cybersecurity issues and how they can surf the internet, um, you know, safely surf the internet. Um, so, yeah. It's a very important issue you raise. And in fact, here in Australia too, we have a, an e-safety commissioner, um, Julie Emnon Grant, who is focused on those very important issues around uh, cybersecurity for um, not only, uh, you know, for businesses, but also for families, um, you know, young women and girls who are obviously uh, accessing 
uh, the online environment. And of course, we're doing more so than ever now during this COVID-19 uh, period. So um, really interesting too, to hear your story about um, the importance of networks um, as you build out your, your careers in, in science and technology. Um, it's really important, obviously, to have those sorts of networks and you know, ordinarily, I think, you know, for a lot of our male colleagues, they have those networks, they they build them, they encourage growth in them. But um, it's lovely, uh, Takalima, to hear that you're, uh, you know, building your own networks uh, in STEM uh, in Samoa. Uh, Dr. Feeney, if I could now turn to you um, about your experiences and how uh, studying in Australia contributed to your career. Um, and what doors did it open for you when you returned uh, to Indonesia? Thanks. Okay, thank you, Julian. Uh, I went to the University of Melbourne to conduct my study. Uh, since this university is one of the best university and well-known globally and graduated in 2004. Uh, during my PhD, uh, I was focusing my study on molecular biology field uh, using barley as a plant model. Uh, many new approach, uh, as well as some cutting uh, and uh, technologies in molecular biology I learned. And the most important thing uh, was experience to conduct a research as a big team member. Uh, I was lucky uh, during my PhD, I have opportunity to join one of the best cell wall uh, group in the world. And uh, I learned uh, how to conduct research in Bali with multidisciplinary team. Uh, the experiences uh, gave me uh, opportunity to develop uh, not only my skill and knowledge in life science field, but also opportunity to develop uh, my confidence uh, and to learn how to manage a big research group. Uh, back to Indonesia, I start my research uh, with only three students and a little uh, amount of funding as well, uh, as well as limited infrastructure to be able to run a molecular biology and then genetic uh, engineering research. Uh, I was one of the first generation of molecular biologists at genetic and molecular biology expert uh, group uh, at my university uh, at Institute Technology Bandung, Indonesia. I was lucky that my institution and my senior college uh, were very supportive uh, at my early career period, so I was able, uh, able to do my research with my students. And uh, fortunately, many opportunities come uh, at the, uh, the first five years of my career as faculty member and my research project uh, to continue uh, and it's continue until now. In 2004, I obtained uh, funding from one of the Indonesia biggest company, uh, Indofood, uh, for my proposed uh, research to develop banana post harvest technology, and then followed by several research awards from Real UNESCO for Women in Science, uh, as well as from Slumberzy Foundation, and Australia and the Four Research Award uh, to continue my research at the University of Melbourne and Queensland University uh, in Brisbane as a postdoctoral fellow and visiting scientist. I start with, uh, started with only three students and now around uh, 100 students and postdoctoral fellow have been joined to our research group, uh, the Banana Group. Of course, I'm very lucky that uh, my former uh, PhD and postdoctoral supervisor in Australia, Prof. Professor Tony Basic, and Dr. Ed Newbegin, always support my career until now. And I would like to thank them for very continued support. And today, I'm very happy that Tony Basic also here with us. Hello, Tony. Thank you so much for coming. Okay, thank you, Julian. Thank you, uh, Dr. Feeney. Um, and it's great, yes, that we have um, people joining us uh, from around the region uh, who are interested in hearing, uh, you know, these, these personal stories. Um, and it's amazing the work that you have done, obviously, to grow uh, the network of molecular biologists uh, in Indonesia uh, through your work and your passion. So that, that, that's fantastic to see. Um, can I please encourage people to uh, continue? I've seen um, questions popping up in the chat. Um, as I said, we will hopefully get some time to uh, allow to post those questions to the panelists. So keep those questions coming in. That's absolutely um, fantastic. Now, I wanted to ask all the panelists, and I might um, again start with Tagalima and then Dr. Finney and then Lisa. Um, how can we? build collaborative STEM networks. So I mentioned this in, in the case of um, Tagalima's response. Um, 
to, to make STEM a place where everyone can thrive across countries and regions, you know, what opportunities are there for collaboration, um, including to address, I suppose, those gender inequalities that I think, you know, Lisa in particular has touched on. So maybe if I could start with Tagalima because you mentioned uh, STEM networks and then I'll turn to Lisa and then Dr. Feeney. Uh, Tagalima. Thank you, Julian. Um, this is a hard one. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I've um, been thinking a lot about it and um, I don't really have a clear answer, but um, because I know it's a, a bit difficult um, in the region because um, we're diverse and, um, and I know for some, we tend to have some, uh, I mean, networking is out of our comfort zone. And it was, I was like that. And um, for me, I actually give credit to um, my Australian Award, uh, Australian Award uh, experience because this was where I was able to have the opportunity to build network, um, not only with um, people in Australia, but um, with some other Pacific Island um, scholars. And it was there that, um, you know, I was able to get out of my comfort zone. And um, I, I know it's a bit difficult, but, you know, this is a challenge within the region and um, uh, I'm very interested to be part of the solution. But another thing that I felt was helpful um, um, in my networking um, experience was um, having a mentor because um, having a mentor, it, um, someone that, you know, you share the same similar um, interest and you can ask for support or uh, guidance and also, you know, throw some ideas around. And, you know, for me, this was what really helped me um, to get to where I am today. Like um, when I was studying, um, I sometimes, I, I would sometime, um, you know, need that, you know, just that support. And so um, I turned to my mentor and she was really helpful. Um, as for opportunities uh, for collaboration and uh, addressing gender inequality, um, I would say early introduction of technology um, in early learning and primary education curriculums. Um, I'm not sure about other Pacific Islands, but um, for Samoa, um, computer is mostly introduced in your year 12. And, um, but I think if we bring STEM in at an early, um, early age and uh, normalize it, um, it will definitely address um, some gender inequality, you know, having both boys and girls learn the same thing from a young age. Um, it would give them, it will give the girls, um, you know, confidence um, to know that, you know, it is, it's normal, not something that only um, boys can um, be a part of. And um, this, uh, I guess this was part of why I wanted to, um, to uh, teach coding um, to young girls at the age of six to 12, because, you know, I wanted them to, uh, to be encouraged and, you know, there is um, something for them in technology, you know, they, there's so much that they could um, uh, do with technology. And I just wanted um, to encourage them to have an interest, take some interest in, um, in a technology career path. And I believe that children taught at an early age have better chance of, um, you know, success and better chance of developing their abilities and their capabilities. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Tagalima. And uh, I see people high-fiving you for, um, you know, the work that you've done in terms of, yeah, like having the confidence to, to, to create those networks. So good on you. Um, Lisa, can I turn to you, please, um, about your experiences with, you know, establishing networks? You know, what, what tools did you use? 
you know, what opportunities are there to try and break some of the down some of those gender inequalities? Mm, yeah, really, um, it's really interesting. I think um, earlier on in my career, I probably um, relied more on official networks. So the research group and my supervisor and the, 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 the colleagues around me. Um, and also maybe my professional society for my you know, branch of science. So in my case, the astronomical professional societies. Um, but there's a, quite a limit to what they can achieve. Um, you know, you, you can achieve great things when you get together in your professional society. Um, we had um, a women in astronomy uh, chapter in, in our professional society. And um, I led that for, for some time and we developed together um, really great policies um, that have been taken up by many universities and research organisations um, around Australia. Um, and, and that work has really improved workplaces, um, which is great, a great example. Um, but then as I've gone through my career, I think I've developed um, more informal networks now with groups of um, people who are working towards the same goals. Um, whether they be in, in gender equality um, or whether they be in STEM um, or even in, in science communication. Um, so lots of really great groups that I'm a member of where people discuss what's going on um, and some really informal where, um, you know, I'm on some WhatsApp groups um, of women in STEM who share information and support each other and ask for help when they need um, when they need it. So I, I would really encourage um, maybe people earlier in their careers to to reach out to their peers and their colleagues uh, and people that they perhaps admire, maybe a bit more senior than you to get advice and, and um, not just mentoring, but that sponsorship, which really means someone actively working to advance your career. Um, and I think all of those things are really valuable. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. I mean, that um, point you make about sort of that multidisciplinary kind of approach to networks is quite interesting. And so I think Dr. Feeney, you mentioned this as well. So I might turn to you and just ask you about your experience with networks. Okay, thank you, Jen. Uh, yes, uh, our banana group it consists of uh, both uh, men and women expert from many fields and each member has equal right to become a project leader uh, as well as uh, each team member has right to be treated equally uh, as part of my experience. Uh, start with monodisciplinary research which was focused on molecular biology approach then our team become a, a multidisciplinary STEM, a STEM team. Uh, we are using a uh, bananas model, uh, bananas model research uh, using different perspective from genetics, molecular biology, nanotechnology, remote sensing, IoT, art, art and design, and so on. So our team uh, is become bigger and bigger, and we have many collaboration with uh, both government and private institution in Indonesia and other countries, and to do uh, banana research. In uh, 2017, uh, we then launched a research foundation, INABIC, a research foundation for Indonesia Biography and Biodiversity, and also International Research Center for Banana, as well as uh, Banana Smart Village. Uh, and uh, in addition, uh, in 2019, uh, I have also appointed as a head of genetics and molecular biotechnology expert group uh, at ITB and also become a ITB academic senate as a representative of our faculty. As you know that our task is to create university and academic policy that applies to the university. Uh, so also uh, I'm glad to share that our faculty and university also lead by women. Uh, in 2017, uh, uh, 17, I was also choose, uh, chosen as a member of Indonesia Young Academy of Science or ALMI. Uh, this uh, young academy of science consists of both men and women in Indonesia, young scientists under 45 years old. As a member, uh, we have uh, so many opportunities to widen our collaboration uh, both nationally and globally, including with Indonesian Academy of Science and Australia Academy of Science members. Uh, for example, in 2016, we held the first Australia Indonesia Science Symposium in Canberra and I became one of the seven conveyors for that prestigious symposium. So yes, uh, in my experience, uh, experience uh, as far as we are expert in STEM field, uh, both men and women have equal opportunity in their career, I think. 
Thank you, Julie. Thanks, Dr. Jeannie. Um, I have one last question to ask you all, and then we will go to uh, questions, obviously, from the audience. Um, my last question, I'll start with Lisa. What's the most exciting thing you've done in your career so far? Oh, that's so hard. I'm going to cheat and say lots of things. Um, okay. Uh, in science, I, I weighed a supermassive black hole in a distant galaxy using only the laws of physics. So watching gas um, whirling around this black hole um, from millions and trillions of kilometres away, um, using the shift in the light towards the red or the blue colour end of the spectrum, um, managed to use some physical equations to, to figure out how much the, the black hole weighed. That was really, really cool. Um, professionally, though, working with hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of engineers, um, you know, experts in different fields and scientists to design and um, watch emerge the, the SKA telescope and uh, that I talked about earlier and the, the Pathfinder telescopes in Australia. Um, incredible and to get the first images from from that telescope after working on it for close to a decade that that's really special and of course um, the other things I do in my career that I didn't even expect to do um, like uh, hosting a tv show about star stars and stargazing writing books um, I toured Australia um, in theatres with Buzz Aldrin second man to step on the moon and um, other Apollo astronauts. So just meeting incredible people, sharing science with the world, um, doing scary nerve wracking things, as well as the, the hard work of research. Um, it's been a really fun journey. Great, thanks, Lisa. Um, Tagalima, can I ask you uh, the same question, but I've also got a question just to throw in from the audience, because we're, I'm just conscious that, yeah, we're, you know, running out of time and I do want to give the opportunity for people and from the audience. So in addition to what you've done, that's uh, super exciting. Uh, can you also talk a little bit about what keeps you motivated to stay abreast of knowledge in your field? So how do you, how do you keep up to date basically with, with developments, you know, in your cybersecurity sector? Uh, thank you, Julian, for the question. Um, well, I'll first answer the exciting part. Um, maybe it won't be very exciting for most, but for me, it's exciting to be actually to be actually, you know, to actually work with um, my colleagues um, in my organization on uh, and sharing my knowledge on um, ways we can uh, try and, uh, you know, ensure that our IT um, IT network or infrastructure is uh, less vulnerable to cyber attacks. Um, so yeah, as you know, like cyber attacks is frequent now um, and it's all around the world. And um, you know, it's something that, um, and to link it to the question, um, you know, with technology, it's ever evolving and you can't really like, you know, something that was there yesterday you come back today and it's a totally um, new, uh, you know, it's evolved. And I would say the way most, um, I, I'm just talking from experience and um, my, from, uh, with my colleagues, um, we join um, forums and, you know, you do a lot of research. It's more like with technology, you just have to research um, if you hear something on the news, you know, just pop on and um, on the Google and start searching. And you know, we we know you know what's um, out there. So um, you know, you, even if you don't have um, direct um, you know experience with it, but just to be able to have that knowledge that you know there's a possible there's a possibility that you know your security could also be um, you know, infiltrated like you, you, um, you could be the vulnerabilities in your own organization could be exploited by someone else. But I think it's all about researching, join forums that you know um, that have a lot of people that share the same interest with you. So. Yeah. 
Sorry, I'm on mute. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Takalima. Uh, Dr. Feeney, can I ask you, what's the most exciting uh, opportunities you've had uh, so far? Yeah, thank you, Julian. Uh, so together with our group, uh, the Banana Group, uh, with local villagers in Indonesia and local government, uh, we have turned a barren village in Bali into last uh, banana small village. Uh, this village then awarded by Indonesian Ministry of Environment and Policy as the best uh, sustainability village in 2020. So I think this is a uh, one of our happy and exciting experiences since our works uh, can be applied and useful to help and boost local economy. Uh, so Zulian, if you don't mind, I'd like to share two minutes a video clip uh, about the Banas Smart Village activities to, to the audience. Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Feeney. Even I'm super excited about bananas now after seeing that. It's really uh, great. Maybe you to come, I have to come to Bali if the pandemic's over. <laughs> I would love to. I would love to. Um, and I'm sure everyone who's watching today would, would love to as well. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, some of the questions um, from, the, from the audience. Uh, Lisa, if I could um, uh, direct this one to you, please. Um, there's a question from the audience about what are some uh, great resources for highlighting the economic and business reasons to increase women's participation in STEM careers. I mean, you referred to it in your opening remarks, I think. For those of us who are struggling to gain traction just using moral or ethical arguments for it, do you have some suggestions? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are a tremendous number of organisations who have released reports um, on STEM and workforce. So I would, if uh, you know, for, for those things, um, certainly in Australia, um, we have a lot of links on our website, womeninstem.org.au. Um, so that one is, is quite handy for, uh, you know, a lot of information. Um, the Women in STEM Decadal Plan as well, the 10-year plan, um, that's available on um, on the web, and that's again got a lot of the research and links behind, um, you know, the justification for uh, increasing participation in STEM. So lots of um, various workforce reports from from Australia, um, but I'm sure overseas in 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 pretty much every nation, people are working on this issue. Um, so um, I would I would certainly encourage people to to take a look at the Women in STEM Ambassador website. Um, 
and uh, you know that the, there will be I'm sure a lot of um, a lot of books about you know workforce needs and uh, you know a bit, bit lighter reading um, but certainly a lot of those sort of in-depth reports uh, available on the web too. Thanks Lisa. Um, there's a couple of questions coming through um, about you know, how people get involved in learning about STEM at different age groups. Um, there's a question about resources available for adult learning, um, also for younger uh, people. Dr. Feeney, I know you do a lot in terms of education um, uh, about your areas of research. Can you talk a little bit about how you in engage? What's the best way for people, whether they're at those older ages who might have a curiosity about STEM or, or, or the younger people that you've engaged with? Thank you, Julianne. Uh, so thank you for the question. Uh, actually, um, yeah, I have an experience to um, build uh, and also collaborate with other uh, the scientists in Indonesia and all around the world, uh, the scientists from Indonesia, we call it diaspora to uh, make a forum, a scientist forum. Uh, and I think it's the, the best way to encourage a young uh, generation and also uh, um, other uh, people from other, uh, I mean, other field uh, from STEM is to uh, yeah, promote that, uh, uh, through the that, that forum, and uh, the forum is uh, uh, made by uh, scientists from a uh, uh, multidisciplinary field. Uh, so we usually, uh, yeah, conduct the workshop, and also we also always conduct uh, the. Uh, I, I also say to Julie uh, in, the, in, the, in the previous, we also conduct as uh, beside the workshop, we also conduct the. Uh, like the science competition for the young generation. So I think it's the, the good thing to promote and boost, uh, especially in Indonesia, uh, promote the STEM for young generation. I think that's, yeah, that, that's my experience, Julie. Great. Um, I have a question from the audience, uh, and Tagalima, if it's okay, I might direct this to you. There's a question from someone in the audience who said, what is the most important point in your life that helped give you that extra push to follow your dreams? Um, okay. I, I guess for me, um, growing up in a family of uh, 11 children, um, so, you know, and... Um, my mom being a role model, she, even when we were still in school, um, she still, um, you know, took courses, um, you know, and so she became that person that we wanted to follow her, like we just wanted, you know, so for me, I guess um, it wasn't, I, I didn't really have, like, you know, I had a dream job, which was to become a doctor. So, you know, I was trying to follow my mom's footsteps to keep, you know, uh, studying and, you know, be educated and stuff. But um, uh, so I guess for me, the important, I think it, it was not a important point in life, but it's the important people in my life that actually pushed me. And, you know, that was the extra push for me because my mom was the role model. My dad was the force behind us because he would be um, standing there. Like, if you know, if you don't do your homework, like, you know, you get some, that's how it is in the someone life. Like you, like you, your dad or your mom will be like standing there, do your homework. This is wrong. This is it. Like, you know, they're all, so he was the force behind. Mom was the role model. And so we just follow that, you know, step. So it, for me, it's the important people in my life that, you know, it wasn't a point in life. It was just the supportive, um, the people, my network my supportive um, um, people around me. So, yeah. Thank you. And it's great. Yeah, I think that's been a concurrent sort of theme throughout all of these is the importance of role models and, uh, you know, mentors, as you say, and be that, you know, from members of your family to, uh, you know, teachers. I mean, I think it's really great to, to hear the various ways in which people are encouraged to 
reach those sort of fantastic heights that you all have in your various careers. Um, I think we're coming close to a uh, conclusion. Um, I did uh, want to thank all of our panelists today, um, to Lisa, to Tagalima and to Dr. Feeney for your um, contributions. Thank you so much um, for the very unique perspectives that you've shared from each of your uh, countries. Um, I know there were questions about where people could access today's recording and certainly I think um, what we will try and do is make sure the recording is put on the Twitter accounts, so the Ambassador for Gender Equality Twitter account. I'm sure Lisa would be happy to have it on hers as well. <laughs> um, I did also want to thank uh, the Australian government agencies that were involved in, in organising today's discussions. Um, thanks to Questacon here in Australia for hosting um, this online event. Um, if you are interested in further information too about uh, opportunities to study in Australia, then there is additional information as well that's available on the DFAT uh, website. I'm hoping that today's discussion really has been one that stimulates um, you know, other discussions about the role of STEM in girls' education, uh, it may stimulate uh, you thinking about, you know, how you might want to do a career change into STEM yourself. Um, I just would encourage you also to continue to discuss this with your networks. I mean, obviously, again, the importance of networks has really come through in each of the panellists' um, uh, interventions today. So I wanted to Thank again the panelists for the fantastic uh, work that they uh, are doing um, to make all of our lives uh, better and to thank you in whatever part of the world you're watching this from for participating in today's discussion. It's been really fantastic. Thank you, everybody.